Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk ETC. I missed you guys the last few weeks. Uh, We haven't been able to coordinate this show. Uh, I've been over in Japan, so the time difference is a little weird, but we've got a really special guest today. And also, I wanted to fill you guys in on some stuff that's been going on in the community in case uh, you guys haven't been uh, following. Just a lot of big news that's been going on. I just want to fill you guys in before we start the show. So uh, if anyone out there hasn't heard, although I'm sure you have, uh, about the ETC Investment Trust from Grayscale. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, another big event that's coming up is the etc thon which is set to take place uh, February 24th through the 26th in Shanghai. And uh, another thing that I think everyone in the community should be aware about is the uh, white hat withdrawal contract that's been extended for two months. Uh, so that's a pretty important piece of information for anybody that was interested in what's going on with that withdrawal contract and the extension, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Also, there was an AMA on 8BTC recently uh, that featured uh, Avatar and Splix and Snaproll, and they were talking and answering questions about uh, some of the the different points on the monetary policy uh, that's being discussed in the community. So uh, that's from the last newsletter that was put out. Uh, So we'll put that in the description for anyone listening on YouTube. That'll be in the description of the video. And uh, on to the main point for today's show, which is we have a special guest with us, Alan McSherry, who's leading the Grotendieck team on the new Scala client for ETC, which this is a client built completely from scratch, and it's built in a functional programming language. And Alan is an awesome guy doing a lot of great work, and it's a great team. And we're really happy to have him here on the show to talk about all the, the great stuff he's doing. Alan, thanks for thanks for being able to join us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for asking me on. Uh, I was listening to um, some of the stuff that you guys have done. It's uh, you know I really want to say thanks from 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 everybody else because um, it's it's great. It's a great service. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, really. It's, you know, I, I always say it's, uh, you know, it's the developers, it's the miners, it's the other community members, it's the investors. We're just trying to let everybody know about, you know, all, all the great stuff that the entire community and all the constituencies are doing. So uh, th- thanks for everything, you know, everyone out there has done and, and thanks for everything you, you've already done in just such a short amount of time. So, uh, Alan, I, I kind of went over this with you, but... Um, something we do on the show if it's someone's their first time on, we just kind of want to introduce them to the community so that everyone out there knows, you know, the, the great people that are working on this project. So, uh, why don't you just give everybody a little bit of your, you know, your background and kind of how you got into the tech space and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, um, I mean, a lot of people have these great stories about starting off in physics and then, uh, you know, becoming, getting into programming just because they needed the job. but. I actually studied uh, computer engineering in university, so um, I've, I've always been in tech, I guess. Uh, in the last year, we did a lot of C++, and then uh, I went to mm. an American company and spent four years there in the R&D department and uh, worked on their web projects, and that sort of ended in the in the first tech bubble. So yeah, I've, I've, I've been um, in tech, I guess, since I, uh, yeah. since I was school, really. Right, right, but uh, blockchain is definitely uh, uh, new to 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 the. It's as new as as tech gets. So how did you? We call it the blockchain rabbit hole. I, I guess that everybody falls into. So how how did you end up getting into blockchain from the greater tech field? I guess you could say. Yeah, that was. Um, I, I I became. I'm not sure exactly how I became aware of uh, Bitcoin, but I think like most people, Bitcoin was the first uh, the first port of call, mm. and I'd always had a. I mean, I was never a big fan of the way that uh, banks operate in terms of central banks and their control of the money supply and and the way that ordinary banks issue credit. Uh, that always kind of um, bothered me. So when I discovered the uh, the Bitcoin monetary policy was you know, it was fixed, uh, set in code, um, and that you could do these transactions across the internet. Um, and, and these had real value, you know, you could exchange them for fiat. I was pretty much hooked instantly. Uh, yeah. So of course, 
when you when you you think at first that Bitcoin is kind of where is is, is sort of the beginning and the end, and I suppose in the very beginning it was the beginning and the end, but it just exploded really, didn't it? I mean, everything you know, there was Mastercoin, there was uh, a, a ton of other stuff that happened um, after that, and and uh, I just I just kept reading and devouring and and figuring out what was going on. I tried to get involved. Um, you know, one of the things that that you discover, I guess, shortly after you discover we have a distributed currency, is uh, how do we how do we um, you know how do we do, how do we do exchanges? I mean, we still have that problem of of not having distributed exchanges. So, one of mm -hmm. the early one of the early uh, attempts there was the Buttercoin project. So um, I tried to kind of get involved in that, uh, but that didn't really work out. They were they were writing all their code in CoffeeScript, and um, I have to admit that kind of set me back a bit. <laughs> so uh, so right. yeah, from I mean, it, it 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 was a long time uh, it was a long time interest, and then probably um, last year I started mm. working full time in uh in in blockchain code and uh scala was my language of choice and has been since i guess about 2013 and um i came across the scorex framework i, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of the scorex framework but it's the uh it's a scala based framework that um uh, mm -hmm. alex chipperneli has put together now so, uh, alex, i was gonna say just yeah. to let you know so i i'm aware of this stuff but uh that's why uh Christian Christian is awesome because he he knows all the uh, the technicals on all this stuff. So I, I usually uh, ask a couple of the intro questions, but a bulk of the actual interesting questions come from come from Christian since he's uh, pretty knowledgeable about all this stuff. So would so, you say would you say Scorex is a library that you use to make blockchains? Would that is that accurate? Yeah, Scorex is an abstract framework. I'd say that you that you then uh, Build classes uh, using the the abstract framework um, classes as base classes uh, to to create your um, to create your blockchain. Okay. Uh, at the time that I'm talking about, when I first came across it, it was it was Scorex one point. You know, it was Scorex very early version. I'm not even sure if it was one point zero, and now it's Scorex two. You know, zero zero release candidate hmm. one or something like that. So in the early days, what I just I just I have to admit, I just took some classes. Um, mm -hmm out of it and uh and use them there were some really good uh networking classes that were that were extremely useful and also they had a great uh scripto library mm -hmm. um, which is uh which is they they use as a dependency and they release the, it has its own release cycle mm -hmm. uh so i i use that as well so presumably and the the one of the reasons that it exists is because uh, maybe forking the open source Bitcoin code is not necessarily the uh, ideal, perfect solution for everybody that wants to try uh, some innovation in blockchains and somehow Scorex is more flexible, more secure, uh, nicer language than C++. Is that correct? Well, I don't want to get into any language wars here, uh, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> Scala... It, you know, Scala is a a, a a very very nice language to uh, to write code in. It's it's quite it's very terse, uh, and you leverage a lot of the uh, you know a lot of the libraries that are built for the for the JVM. But in terms of so in terms of Scorex, the difference I guess with a lot of other code bases is that you can quickly get to some kind of running blockchain in a very with a very small number of lines of code. So, I mean, if you look at uh, you know some of the code bases that are out there. Out there uh, for Ethereum or anything else, there there are thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code. I'm not even sure how many are in there, but Scorex is only about four or five thousand lines of code, um, so it's very manageable to to begin with. Now, all of this with Scorex, this um, I mean, uh, this is this segued you into ETC. Is is that correct? I, I guess um, just to connect the audience with the shift you went you know from bitcoin and blockchain and how did you get into etc well from from meeting alex and uh and, mm -hmm. and uh, talking to about scorex um i subsequently met uh charles and nikos and got involved with um iohk and mm -hmm. uh from there this project was coming up and um uh, they yeah. asked me would I, would I take care of it and i said yeah 
Yeah, why don't you, um, uh, for anyone in the audience that hasn't been uh, following as closely or is just listening to this about, listening, you know, about it now, or maybe knows a little bit about the project, but isn't necessarily completely informed, why don't you tell them a little bit about um, what you guys are, are building and what you're currently working on for, for ETC? Sure. Um, so ETC is a, an Ethereum classic client. Uh, it's built entirely in Scala. Um, and where we're at at the moment, we have we have a team that's that's distributed across the, the globe. We have some people in Argentina. I'm normally in Dublin, uh, but today I'm actually in Poland, uh, where I've just spent two days talking to the to the guys uh, who normally work distributed here in Poland. We all got together and uh, we did some brainstorming about where we're at in the project and, and some of the code structure and how we're going to continue. And um, yeah, I guess where we're at is uh, we started off uh, looking at, OK, how can we just connect to uh, a client, you know, an Ethereum classic client? So the first the first thing we tried to do was just, um, you know, do, do a successful handshake. Uh, and so we, we, we managed that. So we were able to, to connect to the Ethereum network. And then the next step was okay. Well, let's try and let's try and download uh, the blockchain. Uh, so that's that's pretty much the, the the phase that we're in at the moment is we're we're almost completed uh, downloading the blockchain and handling those the blockchain synchronization, which involves uh, a significant part of the of the project because it also involves you know using the the Merkle Patricia tree and getting your persistence right and uh, being able to you know, success. The great thing about working with ETC is actually that the, the, the you, you test straight away. You know, I mean, you know straight away if you've got it right because you can't yeah. connect. You can't get the you can't get the blocks properly. So um, so yeah, we're currently just finishing that up, and we've started our EVM implementation. So that's when you've got a block. Your block consists of a bunch of transactions, and you need to run those transactions through the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, which will produce a state that's uh, different from the state you had before you run them through the the EVM. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the second strand of of what we're working on, uh, and that's that's probably about twenty percent uh, complete at this moment, I'd say. So Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question, Alan? Yeah, sure. Um, for anybody that's listening and is starting to be swayed that hey, maybe I should look into Scala because maybe I want to help with what Alan is doing. Can you give some more convincing arguments why, why you think people would be, uh, would, it would benefit them to learn Scala? Yeah, let's do a language war. I'm on board with that. Let's do a language no, war. No, we let's don't go. have to, wait, 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 wait. We don't, we, don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to criticize other languages, but. No, yeah. no, no, we, I, we, don't, we won't put any other languages down, but we can, you can definitely talk about why Scala is is the, clearly the best language or something? Because I'll, yeah, I'll, and I'll just I'll just say right now I've heard academics for the longest time say, oh yeah, functional is the future, but then uh, in the real world, meaning in industry, I I I don't necessarily see functional taking over and replacing PHP and C plus plus and uh, Java. So if it's really the future, when is the future going to come? So maybe you can answer that question. Well, I mean, I, you know, again, we don't want to get into arguments here, but uh, obviously, mm -hmm. Scala is the best language that's ever been created, and will, <laughs> yeah, in yeah. fact, and not only is it the future, but it's the future's here. Uh, yeah. So, all jokes aside, I mean, Scala is is a is a a natural successor to to Java in many ways. So, for developers who are out there, you know, if they're, I mean, there's a huge amount of Java developers out there. Uh, so for them to move to Scala, the uh, advantages are many. One of the first one being that uh, it's roughly half the typing, so uh, immediately you know it's it's a much more expressive language. But secondly, where Java was um, object oriented uh, to a certain extent and uh, was wasn't so immutable, so the Java collection libraries they're they're mutable when you you alter things in place, which makes concurrency. Uh, and multi-threaded behavior uh, a little bit more tricky to 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 handle. Whereas uh, Scala is naturally immutable, uh, so most of the and, and has a lot of immutable libraries uh, collections. 
So mm. uh, it it favors it favors uh, it's much easier to do multi-threaded um, code with. Um, and I guess some of the other advantage, the, the other major advantage, which you know, as you as you alluded to, their functional programming is so hot right now, and Scala, as well as allowing you to write object-oriented uh, code, also allows you to uh, write um, very functional code. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about uh, functional code is that it's 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 ba it's side effect free or or timeless to a certain extent. So well, actually, it, it is timeless. It is a uh, it is side effect free. So this means that uh, it's you know when you it, it's more testable uh, when you when you test it and it does what it says it does. Um, that's it. So it's uh, it's very popular now and 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 rightly so. But I think the the great thing about Scala is that it does you know lend a hand to to uh, the enormous amount of of developers who are out there who are not quite fully functional yet and also even for even in a functional environment it's good still to have occasionally um you know the ability to to uh, to occasionally write some you know side effect in code mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now i've heard that um so haskell of course is another famous functional language but my, i've heard people say that so haskell is when you're all in on functional and uh, you're really going to jump you know all the way in whole body in the lake but then somehow there's more Scala developers. It's a little bit gentler introduction and easier to learn. Is that true? Uh, yeah, certainly the last point. It is easier to learn. Um, I don't. It, it is a gentler. Yeah, everything there. I think I, I'd agree with um, uh, Scala or Haskell is is very much full body immersion in uh, in functional programming, and functional programming at you know gets gets quite deep quite quickly. Okay. So would there be any reason to ever, uh, your team, to ever do anything with Haskell? Or do you think you could always do everything you want with Scala, Ben? Everything that we've looked at so far can definitely be done with, with Scala. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we've, uh, we've looked at most parts of the system now. And the libraries that we're using you know, are really um, giving us a, a we're really leveraging some of the existing libraries that are out there. So I'm not sure what the Haskell ecosystem would offer that would be better. But for example, we're using right. ACA TCP, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a really, I mean, ACA actors for a start are a very nice uh, concurrency model um, that takes a lot of the it takes a lot of the confusion out of um, multi-threaded and, and reactive programming, and then with ACA, you also get uh, ACA TCP, which allows us to, again, in a very natural way, uh, uh, communicate over over uh, TCP. Okay, interesting. Gotcha, yeah. What about gotcha. uh, what about the uh, people talk about when they want to move a lot of money in a smart contract? They want the this uh, more security, more assurance that the the contract is going to behave as they the smart contract as they. Uh, they think it should. Uh, is there any? Uh, can you make any comments on that? Are you thinking about security and how to maybe even make programs pr provably secure, or at least certain components? Yeah, there's a lot of talk, uh, and I'm doing a lot of listening uh, about in exactly that area. Now, from our from from the point of view, I guess of the of at least the beta, uh, we're going to look at getting the code audited by security professionals, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of provably um, you know, running code that's, uh, that, that's provably secure, that's, not, that's still aspirational in, in my mind at the moment. We don't have a concrete plan you know, to do that. But I do know that, that it, it constantly comes up. So I think that uh, it's probably something that will you know, I just can't say that we we have a plan to do that, but I think it's something in in the future we will have a plan to do that. Okay, okay. I yeah, know it's that. on the yeah. it's on the planning for planning. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's too yeah. far in the future to be able to say anything concrete, other than a lot of people believe it's in the future. Okay, I know Solidity. I was talking to some of their developers, and they're doing things like, yeah. Uh, a common if they see a common pattern that that leads to security issues they'll they want to add warnings 
right to to, to right. and things like that so that's how they're dealing with it for i know yeah. it's one way so yeah when we get to you know at the moment what we're doing is we're building out our our evm so um it's a case of getting the bear to dance at all uh first of all and when we do that we'll you know we'll look around at what uh at what the state of the art is in terms of um secure, securing contracts and uh you know we'll we'll make sure that we're at least as good if not better okay good Sounds and good i believe to me. i believe i um heard that the the vm is very uh it, it was made to be easy to understand it's not very convoluted complex but it, it it's it, it's pretty nice would you, would you agree with that do you mean the the VM is designed in the yellow paper? Yes. The how does it compare to like the complexity of the JVM? If if you can you compare those? Maybe? Oh yeah. Well, the, I mean, one is is uh, is more complex than the other. There's uh, there's a fairly small uh, instruction set. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know because I saw I saw someone posted like an infographic. Uh, explaining the the ethereum yellow paper and it's supposed to like uh be the yellow paper for dummies and it was really confusing for me <laughs> i could i could yeah. it was it was it was a lot of information so um yeah. especially you know i've looked at the yellow paper a few times and it's uh it's it's a bit much it's a bit much for me but the the infographic was actually pretty cool maybe maybe we'll put that in the um the description on, on youtube uh yeah christian for anyone to check that out I have that I have that link saved somewhere. It's actually pretty interesting. Okay. Yeah, when we um just on that uh paper, you know, the, the, that is I think probably everybody's first reaction when they start reading that. Um, you know, it's it's tough to get through. And of course, uh we at this stage we've all I mean all of the developers have have read it, you know, several times. And it's really I, I was talking to uh one of them today and I was just saying have you noticed that the you know the paper is starting to make a huge amount more sense? You know you can kind of read it almost naturally now, and mm. uh, I started nodding vigorously. So uh, it's it's it it is dense in the beginning, but uh, you know over time uh, it does seem to uncloud and and become uh, become far more clear. Yeah, like the fog. Uh, the more you you've been working on the project, the the fog starts to clear. I guess in a sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and then it's that's kind of exciting, you know, when when you start to when when you start to read what was originally uh, looked a little bit like gobbledygook, and you read it and you go like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 uh, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, we were actually talking about this um, uh, before the the show started. Christian, he was telling me about how uh, the more that they they've been working on the project, they they just start to see bits and pieces for what they really are and they, you know it's like learning another language essentially oh, okay you know the, the difference between looking at a bunch of letters and actually being able to read what's on the page i yeah. i suppose in a sense although yeah. that's an over oversimplification but you know what i mean no i think that's a very good analogy actually that is that is kind of what it's like at first it's tiring because you're reading it and you're going like what what and then and then as you say one day you're reading and you go like oh yeah i get this yeah, right. I think I think the natural probably a lot of people there what they do is they they'll find something they don't understand like bloom filters. So then they'll learn that, come back a month later, read it, and there'll be the next thing they don't understand. And then and eventually time goes by and they don't have those those holes anymore. And then what ha what happens is what you said. Oh, now it, everything makes so much sense. Why did I ever think it was difficult? So, um so I, I know this is a little bit of a segue, but uh, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit about this since you've been in tech for so long, Alan, and um, blockchain is so new as far as technology is concerned. Uh, where do you see, uh, with with your experience in tech and your background, and you, you know you work so closely with blockchain now, where do you see blockchain technology, and where do you see ETC? Um, you know, you can give us your your wild thoughts on different use cases and kind of just where you see the technology in five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, well, you know, whatever, whatever you think. Yeah, we, well, you know, we've been kind of so concentrate, you know, so focused on the on the small details of what's what's right in front of us now that I actually haven't uh, given a huge amount of thought to 
to the to the future uh, of the of ETC um, in five years time. I mean, I guess broadly speaking, I would probably like to see um, you know, like everybody else, you want to see some actual uh, real use cases that are not not so speculative. So so the um, so that the, the use cases that are that were you know that it becomes very very useful in um in, in, yeah. i don't quite got the the killer app for um for etc as of as of yet yeah um, well i mean like um blockchain technology one decade you know how do you, how do you see it changing the world or changing the everyday lives of, of people you know in in all the country oh, in many different countries well, I've nothing, you know, particularly new to add to that. To add to that debate, there's a lot of talk about uh, banking the unbanked. Um, you know, you've got the usual use cases of being able to 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 hire a car over the over the internet and turn up and unlock it with a with a private key, never having to meet anyone. Or the same with revolutionizing Airbnb. Um, Wait, I, what's my, that about the uh, unlocking a car? I, I actually yeah, don't so, think I've heard that one yet. So if you have a uh, so if you have a uh, a, a transaction uh, whereby you you basically can transfer the ownership um, of a key to uh, from from we'll say con being controlled by my key to being controlled by by your key um, and then you can use that to just unlock a car so so over the internet you could basically arrange that transfer a blockchain transaction takes mm. place. You turn up to your car, and uh, you have control of the key to unlock the car. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one before. That's interesting. Uh, so, what? What else? Wild, wild speculation is uh, fair game. I, I would like to see. Um, I would like to see huge disruption in in social networks. I would like to see uh, some kind of virtual currency be the backbone for distributed social networks. That's probably one yeah. of the cases that I'd like to see so so currently you know we have a lot of we have these wall gardens where uh, people are mm -hmm. like say Facebook and whatnot um, they make a lot of money out of the data that you provide and I would like to see you know code out there that uses where you have lots and lots of different pods all over the uh, all over the planet um, they use they use a virtual currency between themselves uh, to keep to, to, to balance the books but they're all basically coordinating to uh, to provide social uh, network services, and of course, everything that they they transmit and receive is is encrypted and is only uh, decryptable by uh, by the people that right. it's. Spoken. So that's yeah. that's kind of one of the use cases that sort of is sticking has been stuck with me for I guess two or three years now. So so this is like sort of a, a one-two punch of a or number one, users being in control of their own data and not being the product. Um, and also B, then the users that are on these social networks would be able to be paid for their content or contributions. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, it, there was a, um, there was a, you know, there's been a couple of uh, almost versions of this, but as you say, like that one, two or one, two, three punch with five all together. So, I mean, say for example, you know, you are in a social network and we'll say you're actually um, you're charged for delivering. So if I want to send stuff to you, um, I, I have to pay a little bit to get that delivered. If you want to mm -hmm. send stuff, you got to pay a little bit to get that delivered. So if we're sending and receiving at roughly the same level, you know, we're paying transaction fees to the um, to the to the pods that are handling our our uh, our social stuff or pictures or cats or whatever it is. Uh, but roughly, we're not, you know, we're not, um, we're not generating huge bills. We're not paying huge bills. But if you're a spam and you're trying to advertise to a million people, well, then a million people are not sending you anything, so you're not getting any, you're not getting any currency. But you have to come up with a load of currency to send a million people. Um, right. Ad. So that would be, you know, that would be one way of making of of sort of ensuring that uh, that basically, you know, you receive, you only receive stuff that you want to receive. So you could set your limits, you know. I mean, you, you suppose right. you're getting a lot of stuff even now from spammers who are willing to pay to put stuff on your roll, or you could just up that limit to, to twice whatever it is and and just cut that stuff out. Right. That's just boom market solution. Yeah. To, yeah. Now, to... now I, I had a question about that's an interesting uh, uh, scenario. So by adding a cost, you you would uh, discourage spammers 
but um, one of the benefits of you posting something on Twitter and Facebook is that a million people plus could see it that could see whatever your content is for free. Now, if, if people have to pay for every, every hit, every download, I, maybe some people would be discouraged from using it, or maybe it would be too expensive for some people. So then the cost could be a negative. Well, it, so with a tweet, you know, you're advertising to the planet intentionally, but where I, the sort of use case where I'm, what I'm, uh, that I'm advocating here really is is a social network. So really, I want uh, I want to send stuff to my sisters and my mom, and I want to get stuff from my sisters and my mom, and that's roughly it. And and you know I'm willing mm -hmm. to pay, I'm also willing to pay uh, to send stuff to my friends because I know that none of my data and my network are being mined because these pods. Right. You know, they make their money off the transaction fees. Everything is encrypted. Now they can probably look at some of the metadata in terms of um, you know who's 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 connected to who. I mean that could be a weakness, but you know that's that's stuff that could be I guess worked on. But uh, the point, right. the, the use case that I'm trying to get at is where we sort of we sort of remove the uh, we, we pay basically for the service that we're using. Okay. So and the service that the service that I want to use is to have my cat pictures delivered to uh, to my <laughs> team and to and to have them be able to deliver uh, stuff to me. You know, I, I have no problem paying a, a small amount of a virtual currency uh, to do that. And what I would think is that in order to scale this, you know, you would you will need a a wide uh, network of of these pods. And the way that these pods would interact is they would have to share a common currency. So. I mean, there's already stuff like Dispora that tries to do this, um, you know, these distributed social networks. Uh, so this would be, yeah. this would be, in some sense, similar to that, except that the uh, they would share a virtual currency in order to, um, you know, in order to be able to interact in an economically fair way. So if you start up a new pod, uh, you know, if you're handling a bunch of accounts, well, you're getting paid in the virtual currency for delivering stuff to to other pods. And you have to pay other pods to, uh, you know, to take their stuff or or, or whatever. It just allows a a, a, a uh, economic interaction between um, between these distributed social network pods. That's sure. that's the use right. case. Sure. Sticks in my right. head. Actually, and, and you brought Christian up another was... interesting question, oh, which was wait, sorry. you brought up the you brought up diaspora, which was tries to be a Facebook competitor, decentralized Facebook competitor. But that what they're running into is that people don't care about the, the privacy protections. They don't care about the decentralization as much as Diaspora would like them to. So do you have any thoughts on that, that blockchain is going to provide all this wonderful privacy protection potentially and decentralized distribution of power that no, but the, the public is not going to care, even though they should? Well, I think there might be a, um, you know, there might be a tipping point in that. I, I have certainly, because I'm you know, I keep an eye out for those type of um, articles. I have noticed an uptick uh, in articles that talk about what are the what are the alternatives to Facebook. You know, why are we why do we why are we so blasé about allowing our our data to be uh, mined and used by all these companies? I think there's a sort of a I mean, for people I guess who are in tech and and definitely people who are interested in blockchain. I mean, this is all old hat. But I think for the general, you know, even even in in the mainstream, it's starting to dawn on people, uh, you know, why Facebook is free in inverted commas. Yeah, I I I think I know what the tipping point is going to be. Honestly, for I think a decentralized social network will actually be popular at some point, and I think the tipping point is all about content. And once you have, say, a nice critical mass of people that are on there producing interesting content um, and they're getting paid for their content directly through this um, blockchain uh, social network, you're going to start to see more and more people gravitate towards the content that's on there as opposed to the content that's on, say, something like Facebook. Because I, I just think um, just like the, the content on the open, unfiltered, internet is just far and away more interesting than say something on like cable TV for for the new generation of people I, I think on the new social networks that are decentralized and start to pop up 
the content on there is going to be just by virtue of of so much competition uh open competition it's just going to be far and away way better than anything you can see on facebook yeah and i i and think so it's just gonna it's right. just gonna snowball yeah. from there no, but see, but look, notice that you didn't say that people are going to switch because all of a sudden they're enlightened about the importance of privacy and decentralization. It was uh, you know, I think the funny thing about that is is um, a, a lot of the people that are interested in privacy and decentralization, they don't necessarily make up a huge chunk of the general public, but a yeah. lot of these people are the type of people that get movements going on the internet you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. um so it's not that they represent a large chunk of people but these are the types of people that make things happen on the internet i, I don't know I, I can't really describe it what do you think alan yeah i'm not sure uh i, I don't know what the tipping point is because i mean i look i see similar things with uh i, I thought there was going to be a tipping point away from whatsapp to the likes of uh signal um, mm. But and a lot of people do use Signal and and you know when um, when there was that that scandal recently, uh, Signal became a lot more popular. But people, mm. I mean, WhatsApp then just claimed, you know, and I don't, I, I'm not saying it's wrong or right that they were encrypting everything end to end, everything was secure. Then everybody just immediately forgot about that. And I was, you know, <laughs> just shows Wait, can that you, I'm not. Can you enlighten people that aren't familiar with the the scandal you're referring to? Well, there was a um, they, they, so after WhatsApp uh, claimed that they had encrypted end to end, there was an article um, that showed that under certain circumstances, the the keys that they used to encrypt um, were exposed. So basically, there was a, a security flaw. I can't remember the details to be honest, but I just uh, I remember reading about it, and uh, I remember not being too surprised. Um, you know, I, I don't think that they they. It was a it was a reaction to the fact that they were about to lose a lot of share to Signal. That was how how I read that. Mm -hmm. Whereas Signal, you know, their purpose was to be secure from from the beginning. Long story short, most people don't care about privacy. <laughs> well, I, you know, you know I, think, I think that there's that's that's you know it's hard to escape that uh, conclusion that there is a certain amount. I know, of, I know, um, blasé. Uh, I don't. It, you know, it won't happen to me, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if the Snowden revelations didn't convince people, I don't know what <laughs> else could convince yeah. people. I don't know. I, I guess it's a it's a combination of things. I, I think the the privacy. I, I don't think people completely discount it, but I think the the overall experience on the platform is the number one thing. And and then if they're comparing, say, you know a Facebook and a decentralized Facebook, I, I think privacy could be a tiebreaker for sure. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, I think it, I think it does count for something for people, but uh, in reference to like signal and WhatsApp, just the network effect that WhatsApp has the signal privacy. It, it's not enough to, it's a tiebreaker, but it, it doesn't count as like three or five points. I, I, don't, I don't know. I see. Yeah. So, yeah. but I, I think there could come a point when, uh, if Signal has a massive network effect and you know a really good, uh, and it's a really great platform, and people are starting to decide, you know, because it's these things evolve from the younger generation. It's when younger people get their cell phones and say, "Oh, what, what chat message? What what messaging application are we going to use?" Sure. If Signal can break the tie with privacy, you know, boom they're going to have a whole new generation of people using Signal over WhatsApp. Yeah. And not only does, does do blockchains provide privacy, um, but there's another, another equally important attribute, which pe people use the word decentralization a lot. But I don't know if people, when they say that, I don't know if they're thinking that the, the blockchain distributes the power. So you don't have a, a centralized pope that could make decisions on a social media platform you know, there's no, there's not that, that danger. And so, and again, I don't know how many people are worried about uh, somebody in power uh, doing something malicious, but that's certainly a, something to be concerned about. And blockchains can help protect from malicious actors that are in power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a, an important um, 
uh, plank in in that sort of potential use case is that you know if your if your particular pod gets censored, you should be able to just migrate over to a different pod. You know, be that in a different country or whatever. And because they're economically connected through the through the currency that they all use, um, you can do that. Yes. Oh, that's true. Um, I, I don't the, what what Alan was just talking about as far as because um, there's been a a lot of controversy lately about you know people being banned on Twitter you know for better or for worse. That's what I was. The, the fact, yeah, the the fact of the matter is, um, yeah, I think you guys are both both right about that. Um, more, I guess, more so than the, the privacy thing. I think the the censorship is a is a big one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not just censorship, oh. but like political bias. Right. Uh, right. Right. Like so I, I see what you're saying. So it's like the 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 network being impartial completely, and just you know whatever people's thoughts are just get out there naturally yes and that's just the end of it yes now alan what do you think about this this idea so i think about blockchains as out there in cyberspace um uh you know outside the control of any nation or person and so in a sense it's almost like the first steps towards an artificial intelligence you see you know what i'm saying it, it's yeah, I, I I do know what you're saying. Um, the singularity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, certainly, oh I could see some kind of, you know, emergent behavior maybe coming out of out of this, uh, rather than, you know, a, a a programmed. You know, I I tend to think of a of a an artificial intelligence as being. You know, you'd start with sort of some of the machine learning, or, or uh, you know, some of the some of the technologies that are going on today, and uh, and that would just somehow, uh, you know, we get to the stage where that would be able to build its own AI, which would obviously be, you know, far better than the one that we built, and and then that would take off. Um, whereas I kind of see the, the sort of what's happening with, with blockchain and a lot of the smart contracts that that go out there, uh, that. You know that that may be some kind of uh, unex some some kind of unexpected uh, behavior will emerge from a lot of different people acting in their own acting in their own self interest and and that's this is that's this kind is, of exciting is, and a bit worrying. <laughs> this is too much for me. I can't even beat my phone at chess. I, this is too much. <laughs> I can't deal with this. This is too much, guys. Well, no, but no, I, uh, go yeah. one last point, just to not to yeah. belabor this, but let's say no, no, no. I want no. I think this is interesting stuff. Okay. Actually, I, I do have a quick question for Alan okay. that I've actually never got a chance okay, to ask uh, someone about AI and and writing. So I read some. I I read something interesting one time. I don't know where or who wrote it, but uh, it was about that. The really conceivably the first AI would just be a computer that could rewrite its own computer code. And at that point, it would just keep rewriting its own code. How, how is there, does, does that sound valid? It, it makes sense to me in my head, but I don't know how much sense that makes well, there's, from there's, a development perspective. Well, there's software that could, that could do, in a sense, do the development for you. That's what machine learning is all about. It, developers don't have to write programs anymore. The machine learns its by itself. Yeah, but sense. could it rewrite its own development machine learning code? You know what I'm saying? Like rewrite yeah. its own code. Well, you could like feed it a new language and it could it could learn a new language. So if you call that re well, I get no, no, writing, but it's no, fe no feeding. It just it rewrites its own code. I, yeah, that I, I don't know. About. Yeah, that's the thing. So, OK, okay yeah, Alan, what do you what are your I've thoughts read, on that? I mean, I've read, um, you know, I've read that there are people who have spent, you know, who have been, I mean, Elon Musk, for example, has invested in um, uh, significantly in in AI companies. And I read that the reason he did that was just to to keep an eye on them because he's quite concerned that something like that will happen. That, you know, the, <laughs> the first AI that can create an AI um, will just, you know, will just do, will, will just go nuts and uh, and we'll never put the, we'll never get the genie back in the bottle. Um, that's scary. That's that's not a great way of expressing it, but those were those were the the basic. Uh, that was his basic concern. I mean, you, you think of it like, you know, when you when you write a uh, when you write a um, compiler uh, for a language. Uh, you know, one of the first things you can do then 
is uh, is is um, is you know rewrite the compiler in the language and use the compiler to uh, compile what you've just written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know there is uh, there is I guess precedent for um, for doing crazy things like that in software. Yes. Well, if Elon's if Elon's worried, then I'm worried. No, um, well, Alan, the, the question I wanted to ask you earlier, and I, I really want to ask this. So let's go with your example of the the blockchain car door opener. Okay, and then of course you could have a, a house door opener, and then the money is on the blockchain, and we know that blockchain uh, is uh, sensor proof. So th as more and more of our our the functionality of our lives is on the blockchain. And nobody can stop the blockchain. Nobody could censor it. Can you see that it's it's there's like this mysterious entity that's all of a sudden taking taking over more and more of our lives that that nobody controls. That that's a, kind of an interesting well, image. Yes, uh, you know it's it's plausible. Uh, I mean, definitely, uh, I I can see that is the short answer. Okay. So are you saying when I don't pay my rent, I get locked out of my apartment immediately? Uh, that could happen. Uh, that well, sucks. <laughs> uh, well, actually, that, wait, no, but that brings up another question. What if somebody makes a smart contract that all, after it, they let it loose, and then they, they say, oh, I really wish I didn't do that, but they, they wrote it in such a way that they can't stop it. Then what, what do you do? See what I'm saying? Because it's sensor proof. Yeah. You can write a smart contract negating it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So just, I don't know. Software well, out of software out of control. That's that's the that's what, what I the in a nutshell what I'm thinking of. Yeah, I mean that sounds it, it sounds like a lot like I guess you know a virus that you accidentally release that uh, you know just keeps running and running and doing what it's supposed to do. I mean the, one of the safeguards that we have is that uh, contracts should run out of you know they should run out of uh, gas. They should eventually. Um, you know, if they're not supported by external stimulus, like people calling the, mm. the contract, then you would hope that uh, they just run out of gas and die. Uh huh. Mm. And we've had already an example of what I'm referring to: the the Dow attack, right? They couldn't just say, "Oh, bummer. We let's okay, let's kill the smart contract." Right? Once it was on the blockchain, the, it's not so easy to stop it anymore. So they had to uh, do that's other true. things. So yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I, uh, I suspected that. All right. Yeah. It, it, and you know, we we know what happened. Yeah. Whereas with yes. the web server, web application, I can just say, oh, okay, wow, that that made a mess. Okay, I'll just I'll just turn the server off until I sort out this mess. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I see. I see what you're saying now. Because the the web server, you have, have a way to you have a way to turn it off. Yes. There's no turning it off. Okay. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um. Oh, so also, uh, this is uh, another uh, kind of a, a thread derailment, I guess. But uh, uh, so this is a shout out to to my older sister, sister Cheryl, and she had a suggestion for the show, which was um, to also ask uh, kind of what some of the guests are reading or watching or movies that they're into and stuff like that, uh, as far as you know, having the community get to know them and, and what they're all about. So any, anything interesting? I know you're uh, probably neck deep into Scala code and ETC stuff, but anything interesting uh, you know, you're reading or watching these days, Alan? Um, it, the last, I guess, really, really interesting book I read was, uh, was Sapiens. Um, and I can't remember. I think it's Noah Huval might be the name of the, the author. And the reason I remember that I actually read it a couple of years ago, and then I started. I liked it so much, I started reading it again pretty recently. And just by coincidence, I happened to be talking to one of the developers earlier today, and he started reading it, and he's absolutely loving it as well. Uh, so yeah, that's probably one of the uh, one of the best recent books that I've that got I've read. A, got a quick summary for anyone uh, out there listening, maybe. Well, it, <laughs> it, it, so this book basically explains everything that has happened up until now it's it's not a work of, of fiction it's a, a work of um, explaining mm -hmm. the entire evolution of, of the human race up until now uh, huh. and that's and pretty wild it, it, 
yeah, he does it in a um, in a very readable way. You know, you find yourself turning a page and nodding your head and going, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. I get that. And um, okay, yeah, it's I, I I would highly recommend it actually. Uh, I think it's Noah Noah Yuval. I think is the guy's name. I'm not. I can't remember his second name. Let me just open it up here. And it's called Sapiens, as in Homo Sapiens. Is that right? Yeah, Sapiens. Sorry, I beg your pardon. His full name is Yuval Noah Harari. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, Thank you know what? We can actually probably put a, a link to um, that that book or you know a link to that book in the description on YouTube as well. So uh, uh, shout out to Cheryl for that question. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys have uh, anything else to cover. Uh, you got any anything else you guys want to go over, Christian, Alan? No, I think I've uh, talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Um, well, then, uh, Alan, I uh, just want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for the time. Thank you for everything you've done for ETC so far and everything you're going to do. And we're really excited and uh, uh, happy to have you on the show. You're welcome. And, and thanks very much for having me. It's, it's been nice to talk to you guys. Yeah. Same here. And Christian, uh, uh, we missed a few shows here, but uh, great to great to do this with you again. And everybody out there listening, uh, thanks for checking out the show, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye.